Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the College of the Holy Cross. The McFarland Center sponsors a range of lectures, discussions, conferences, and other special events that foster dialogue on questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. You can find a schedule of our events and videos of past events and eventually of this one on our website, holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. I'm really happy to welcome you to the 2024 iteration of the Thomas More Lectures on the Humanities, a series that explores the ways the humanities illuminate moral dilemmas, enhance our capacity for understanding and empathy, and help us to imagine more just ways of living. And today I'm really excited to be welcoming to campus Heather Cox Richardson, a remarkable scholar and public intellectual whose career is a testament to the power of humanities study. Heather is a well-known historian and an expert in 19th century America, a professor of history at Boston College, and president of the Historical Society, an organization designed to bring academic history to general readers. To our most voracious readers in the audience and to scholars, she is the author of a number of books on American history. The Death of Wounded Knee from 2001, I'm sorry, The Death of Reconstruction from 2001, <laughs> Wounded Knee, Party, and po Party Politics and the Road to an American Massacre from 2009, West of Appomattox, The Reconstruction of America After the Civil War, all of these were selections for the History Book Club. West of Appomattox was also an editor's choice selection of the New York Times Book Review. She's also the author of 1997's The Greatest Nation on Earth, Republican Economic Policies During the Civil War, in 2014's To Make Men Free, A History of the Republican Party, and to round it out in 2020, How the South Won the Civil War. I suspect for a large number of you here, like me, that you wake up each morning to Heather's insights in your mail inbox. <laughs> I have no idea how she does it. I often think that in the morning when I get up. Uh, she's the creator and writer of the hugely popular Letters to an American, a daily digest with 1.5 million followers, but if you think that's a lot, she has 1.8 million Facebook followers. It helps readers understand today's political landscape through the lens of American history. This work extends to Heather's newest book, Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America, a 2023 New York Times bestseller. Uh, you may have noticed coming in that our friends at Tidepool Books are outside and had that book available for sale, and Heather will be here available briefly after the event to sign books before she joins another faculty discussion. Heather's come today to help us to think about the state and future of the humanities in America. In recent years, there's been no shortage of humanities and crisis books and opinion articles, and plenty of survey and enrollment data suggesting a loss of confidence in the worth of the humanities studies. The College of the Holy Cross, on the other hand, by tradition and by choice, is tremendously committed to the humanities alongside the social sciences and the sciences. <clears throat> We see the humanities in particular as a means of educating thoughtful, capable, highly reflective citizens who can go on to lead and improve society. So we believe that there's a lot at stake in a conversation about the future of the humanities. After Heather speaks, she will join in a conversation about the future of the humanities with two Holy Cross leaders, Vincent D. Rougeau, the president of the college since 2020, 2021, and Elliot Vistanzi, who returned this year to his alma mater to serve as provost, which is to say the chief academic officer, and dean of the college. We'll have a chance during that conversation to pose some questions to the three of them. Some of these have been pre-submitted, and I have them on cards right in my pocket. You can also submit questions on cards to Ruby Francis and Sarah Potter, who will come around to get those, uh, or use the microphone at the center, uh, and I'll do my best to toggle between those question formats. We will welcome questions. Uh, I understand that the audience may want to ask a whole range of questions, but we're going to welcome questions given the purpose of our lecture and our limited time that take on the theme at hand, which is to say the state and the future of the humanities. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Heather Cox Richardson. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you to Holy Cross and to President Rougeau for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to be given this particular assignment because, like you, I hear all the time about how the humanities are dead. And to paraphrase Mark Twain, I would suggest that reports of their death are greatly exaggerated. 
First of all, there's the practical consideration. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor, an average person in the United States will hold 12 jobs between the ages of, 80, of 18 and 54. That means the average American will change careers five to seven times during their working life. And that means, of course, in our era that many of those jobs are not yet invented. That means that rather than learning the particular skills that you need to go into a profession that exists today, you need instead to learn general ways to think, to adapt, and to innovate to bring on the 21st and even the 22nd century. So there's the practical reason to think that we need to think broadly about the way we educate people. But then there's also the, the human reality that when the coronavirus hit, if you think about it, what people turned to immediately was to music and art. People sang together. Yo-Yo Ma did his, his, um, his playing on the internet. Uh, Patrick Stewart read Shakespearean sonnets to people. These things became the way that humanity dealt with the unthinkable pandemic that we were working under. But I would like to make an argument today that the liberal arts are important in the United States because they, they are mounting a profound defense of American democracy. So let's start with the first question. What are the liberal arts? You hear about liberal arts all the time. What, in fact, does that mean? The meaning of liberal arts is that they are the study of creating an intellectual grounding, a deep intellectual grounding in humanistic inquiry. Okay, what does that mean? A humanist is somebody who seeks human answers rather than divine answers to social issues. Liberal arts then is the humanist inquiry to achieve a deep understanding of the elements of human interaction and human society. What, what I'm suggesting there is that what we do when we study the liberal arts is to look for human answers to human societies rather than looking for divine intervention to give us a series of laws or rules under which we should all be living. You with me on that? All right. But think about it. Now is a time when there is a significant proportion of our population and of populations in other countries that are seeking to construct societies around religion rather than around that humanistic inquiry in government. That is, the liberal arts, I think you can argue, is a defense of a society based in humanism, in human answers to society's problems. That, of course, is the principle on which the United States was founded. So if you think about the life of Europeans on the North American continent, they did not always have that vision. The Puritans who arrived in Massachusetts Bay Colony, in fact, believed that they had what I used to call a hotline to God, a direct relationship with God, and that God was directly uh, uh, organizing and providing the laws for the organization of their society. You also probably know, if you know your Puritan history, that within that ideology, they also had constructed a series of guardrails, societal guardrails, to guarantee that they could function as a society, despite the fact that the heart of their philosophy was the idea that every individual had a relationship with God, had an individual relationship with God. But you can see the problem with that already, I suspect, that if every individual has a hotline to God or is, speaking, is having God speak directly to them, they're not speaking back to God, by the way is having God speaking directly to them. It's only a question of time until one person says, well, wait a minute, my God is telling me something different than your God is telling you. And that's, of course, what happens in the 1630s, 1636 to th 1638, when we get the antinomian crisis here in Massachusetts in which Anne Hutchinson, I told you I was going to work in Anne Hutchinson. I'm a fan of Anne Hutchinson. Anne Hutchinson said to the leaders of Massachusetts Bay Colony, no, you're not right in the way that you're interpreting the laws that you are arguing that God has laid down. That was not the only way, though, to think about having a, a strong relationship of a society with a spiritual power. 
uh, Puritans also looked deeply at the idea of education, the idea that you had to understand the world, you had to learn about the world in order to discern the true nature of God's instruction and not to be knocked off course by Satan. Did you think you were going to be hearing about Anne Hutchinson and Satan today? <laughs> Nobody ever asks me about, about the Puritans, so when I get a chance, I like to go into them. Um, they, were, they were one of my real interests in graduate school. But some of the Puritans, especially the Puritans back in England, began to turn their attention to the idea of the role of education in human society. And John Locke, who was educated at Oxford, had a considerable mind, and he turned it to the problem of human society. How do you order a human society so that you don't run into the sorts of problems, and not that he is looking directly at Massachusetts Bay Colony, but the problems that you have when you organize a society around religion? First of all, he concluded that humans were not born with ideas about the world, but rather that they learned from their experiences, and that all knowledge came from trying out new ideas and making new observations. If men, is what he's concerned about, figured out their own appointed path in the world, they would also be able correctly to discern the natural laws that God had instituted to rule the globe. New information could change the way that you understood those rules. And what that meant was that the traditional patterns of society, the ones that had been handed down and under which people in England were living, were not necessarily a true reflection of God's natural laws. The way you learned those was through deep and changing inquiry. Government, then, was a social compact. And as a social compact, put together to enable men to live together in peace, it should not rest on those religious or traditional rules that, after all, might change as people learn better to discern what God had told them in the laws that he had instituted on the globe. Those traditional laws of wealth or of religion or of tradition were arbitrary, and government should be based on true laws. Government, then, should be based on the consent of the governed, the idea that men had the right to think about the way that their government worked and to make it as close to the natural laws that they believed were contemporary and that they believed were, had been laid down, in the, that they in their era discerned as being having laid down by God. In 1690, John Locke published two treatises on government in which he developed these ideas about how society worked. That search for the idea that human answers to the problems around us could discern the rules under which human beings sh should live came to the United States, and it came to the United States as a search to understand science and art and the humanities and music and religion and so on. Remember Ben Franklin and his kite? The reason he's out there with the kite and the key, imagine that just while we're at it, in a thunderstorm is not because he has a death wish, but because he's trying to understand the way the world works. He's trying to understand electricity. Thomas Jefferson does something similar with the Bible. Remember, he decides he's got to figure out the true principles of the Bible, so he literally begins to cut one up and put it together in a form that he thinks explains better to him what he thought that uh, Jesus of Nazareth was thinking than the current translations that he had of the Bible. That idea that human beings can discern how to order a government is at the heart of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's the Lockean influence on the Declaration of Independence. Are you with me so far? They also, the framers, when they wrote the Constitution, explicitly rejected the idea of divine governance. James Madison of Virginia, 
who is one of the key thinkers behind the Constitution, really the thinker behind the Constitution, was no foe of religion himself, but he recognized in Virginia when he was growing up the problems of itinerant preachers who are attacked, um, uh, who, who are imprisoned actually, for attacking the established church of Virginia. So even though they're all Protestants, they're Protestants of different flavors, and certain ones get, uh, certain of the itinerant preachers get imprisoned because uh, they're perceived as attacking the established church in the state. Seeing this, Madison came to believe, when he was a college student, by the way, uh, Madison came to believe that men had a right of conscience. What he meant by that he's going to put into section 16 of the Virginia Declaration of Rights. And he does that in 1776, and it's the Virginia Declaration of Rights on which our own Bill of Rights sits. The, the, our Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. The section 16 of the Virginia Declaration of Rights reads that religion or the duty which we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. And therefore, all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of their conscience, and that it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity toward each other. In, 18, in 1785, then, Madison explained what was at stake in the idea of religious freedom and the lack of an established religion in a government, uh, in a government um, was not just religion, but was also representative government. In a memorial and remonst uh, remonstrance against religious assessments, Madison explained in 1785 that the establishment of one religion over another attacked the fundamental human right, the unalienable human right of conscience. If lawmakers could destroy the right of freedom of conscience, they could destroy all other unalienable rights. And an unalienable right is a right that cannot be uh, given away or sold, that cannot be alienated from you. And that's one of the reasons that the founders put in the Declaration of Independence life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness instead of life, liberty, and property because you can alienate property. You can sell property. You can give property away. You can't give away your right to the pursuit of happiness. So if lawmakers could destroy freedom of conscience, they could destroy all other unalienable rights. And what that meant was that those people who were in charge of government could throw representative government out the window altogether and make themselves tyrants. So in order to make sure that men had the right of conscience, the First Amendment to the Constitution reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In 1802, Thomas Jefferson, called the, he was president at the time, called this amendment a wall of separation between church and state. And in January, on January 1st of 1802, he explained to a group of Baptists from Danbury, Connecticut, what he meant by that. He said, religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship. The legitimate powers of government reach actions only, he wrote, and not religious opinions. So the founders and then the framers in the United States of America deliberately rejected the idea of a traditional government based on either religious laws or the laws of tradition or custom as they had been handed down in Great Britain. Are you with me on that so far? So if government is not going to be based on monarchy or on religion, and is going to be based on natural laws that are discerned through careful study, that puts the burden of discovering those rules on those of us who engage in the study of the liberal arts. Because we are the ones who study how societies 
and how human beings actually work. So here at Holy Cross, for example, there are departments in history, in English, in classics, in modern languages, in religious studies, in theater, in music, in visual arts, as well as the sciences, as well as the social sciences. And those emphases are global, as they should be, and not just about America, because that is how we discern the ways in which human beings interact with their world and the rules by which that world operates. And those things change every single day. So I'm not going to embarrass myself today by talking about the philosophies behind fields other than my own. Uh, but I would like to say something about history in this moment and why history is so important in the moment in which we find ourselves. Okay, still with me? History is not just about facts and what happened in the past. The philosophy behind history is that history is a study of how and why societies change. What creates change? And people have different ideas about that. Some people think that it's great men who create change. Some people think it's a belief in religion that creates change. Some people think it's mass movements that create change. Some people think it's the economy. Some people think it's race. Some people think it's gender. Some people think there are any number of different ways in which societies change. And what historians do is they look at sources that are produced at the time to see how societies changed over time from one point to another point so that you can look at the, the change in a society from A to B and say, these are the things that created that change. So it's one of the reasons when I, when I write the letters that what I emphasize is, a large, is often different than what journalists emphasize because they're looking to tell you what happened. I'm looking to tell you what things happened that create change. And that's a really different perspective than, um, than a journalist will bring to the modern news because I don't, I don't really care about stuff that doesn't, um, doesn't look to me like it's going to impact something. So for example, I did not cover in the letters from an American, I did not cover the Republican primary debates. Because Trump was such a front runner, it, it didn't seem to me that any, there was going to be any difference to what happened on that stage. But I did cover a one minute ad that um, Sean Fain, as the president of the UAW, cut with President Joe Biden, in which they praised each other. Because what happens with labor in the upcoming election is going to be a really big, uh, is going to create really big change in the United States. So I covered an ad on social media, the journalists covered the Republican. Um, the Republican primary debate. So we, are, we study what creates change, and in order to study that, we have to be really careful about making sure we look closely at that change. Now, we're in a moment in the United States where there are a number of people who are working to reduce our history, to reduce the study of our past to a very simple narrative that serves a political end. So, for example, people who are behind the 1776 project, which was instituted at the end of the, uh, of Don uh, the Donald Trump presidency, and which sought to create uh, what uh, the former president called a patriotic history to which we could return, are, I'm going to argue, trying to reestablish the idea of a set of religious or traditional laws to which the country should adhere. The very things that the founders and the framers turned against, they are trying to reinstitute. Now think about what it means to say that there was a perfect past, as for example the 1776 project does, or the curriculum that's been adopted of late in the state of Florida. What it means to say you have a perfect past is to say that there was a time somewhere back there in which this nation followed a set of principles, a set of rules, a set of laws that had been imposed either divinely or through that tr set of traditions, again, that the founders and the framers threw out, that we could enjoy again if only we got rid of all the messiness of the laws and the things that people who study the liberal arts do, if we stopped paying attention to the ways in which societies changed, if we stopped paying attention to the messiness of humanity, and we got back to that, we could once again return to a perfect past. 
The trick to that, of course, is that in order to go back to that vision, in order to go back to that perfect past, you need to have somebody who is willing to cut through the messiness of humanity and the messiness of our current legal system to do that. That is, that vision of a world that was perfect in the past requires, or it serves, uh, anyway, it serves an authoritarian movement to say we can get back to that perfect past so long as we have a person who is willing to cut through all the crap around us and find those perfect religious or traditional laws again. Some people on the left are doing something similar but from a different perspective. They're doing the opposite of what the 1776 Project does. And I'm sorry, I'm assuming that you know the 1776 Project, and I shouldn't be. The 1776 Project was the one that said that, the, that America had always striven for, um, for equality and justice before the law, and anything that did not serve that end was temporary, was a blip, and that it, it even, for example, in periods of uh, Jim Crow or Juan Crow, or, um, or lynching, for example, the people who were engaged in those practices were aberrations and they were soon set on the right course by other Americans who had better ideas. Uh, there's a, a, a corresponding opposition to that in which people are suggesting that the foundations of American democracy have been so tainted by racism and by sexism, and sometimes they talk about classism as well, that our institutions of democracy are irredeemable. I would argue that in both of those cases, a political narrative is determining those arguments and they are not actually serving the interests of history so much as they are serving the interests of politics, which is a different thing than the liberal arts. It is part of how we live as a government. But I would argue that in order to protect democracy, we need to have a careful examination of facts no matter where they lead us. And humans are complicated. I just like to say humans got a human, right? And I would like to illustrate that by turning to the history of Holy Cross. Fascinating history. Holy Cross and the history of Holy Cross is deeply entwined with the history of the Healy family. The college starts in the early 19th century, as you know. How many of you are students here? Okay, and, fa and faculty? So most of you, you probably already know this story, but I like it so much I'm gonna tell it anyway. <laughs> you know, it's funny, I don't get to talk about history very much any longer. And, and people come to hear me, and often I'm not talking about history. And I just feel a little bit sorry for people who come to hear me when I'm actually asked to talk about history, because I'm like, wait just a minute, I'm gonna tell you about the Puritans. And you're like, wait a minute, I thought you were gonna tell us about the new election, the upcoming election. I'll get to that, maybe. Um, the college burned in uh, July of 1852, as you know, and it, uh, it, it almost went under when that happened. And the college is rebuilt then, um, and it reopens in 1854, and it's rebuilt thanks to money that is donated to this institution by the Jesuits and by donations from outside. The largest donation that enabled the college to rebuild in, 18, in the 1850s was $2,300, which is a really large sum of money at a time when people make between 25, a, a skilled worker will make between 25 and $30 um, uh, a year. Um, I'm sorry, a, a month, it's about a dollar a day. It's a huge sum of money. Um, that was made uh, by Patrick F. Healy, a member of the Jesuit Society. He's a Jesuit scholar and he's the brother of the first valedictorian of Holy Cross, a man named James Healy, uh, and they produced that money because their father had just died, and they had sold his estate, and they had cash to burn. Um, they had sold their father's estate in Georgia, and that estate included 49 enslaved people. They had sold that estate, including the, the enslaved people, and part of that money came and rebuilt Holy Cross. Sounds like a very simple story, right? But it's not because people are complicated. The Healy's father was a, name na a man named Michael Morris Healy. He was an Irish immigrant to the United States. He came in 1815. He moved to Georgia. Uh, Georgia was the frontier at the time. 
Uh, he moved to Georgia where he did extraordinarily well. He managed to, uh, by the end of his life, to accumulate 1,500 miles of land near Macon, Georgia, right in the center of the state, and became very wealthy compared to the other people around him. He acquired enslaved people, as I say, at the, by the time he died, he owned 49 enslaved human beings. But their mother, the mother of the boys that I'm going to tell you about, was named Eliza Clark. She was a woman of color. And in 1829, she became uh, uh, Papa Healy's common-law wife. And they lived as husband and wife for uh, their, the, the rest of the time they were both alive. Uh, neither one of them took another spouse, and he always spoke of her as his wife and treated her as his wife. But be, being black in Georgia, it was illegal for them to marry. It was also illegal for him to free her. They lived together faithfully, as I said, um, but Michael Healy had a problem, aside from the fact his wife was enslaved and legally he owned her and he couldn't free her, but under Georgia law, children took the condition of the mother. So the children who were born of that marriage were all enslaved to their father, who wanted desperately to free them, but he couldn't. So what did he do? He ended up quite fortuitously, in the 1840s on a steamship that was traveling between Boston and New York. And on that steamship traveling between Boston and New York was the Bishop of Boston. And the Bishop of Boston said to, his, to, to Michael Healy that he should enroll his sons at a new college in Worcester, Massachusetts, the College of the Holy Cross. And he figured this was the way that he could get his sons and later his daughters out of Georgia and move them to free territory, free states, and he did so. When the four oldest got to Worcester, Massachusetts, he, the father was not um, a practicing Catholic uh, in Georgia much at all, but he, he moved them into the Catholic Church. He baptized them, or they became baptized into the Catholic Church and considered themselves reborn in that moment and went on to have extraordinarily successful careers. The oldest son, James, became a Catholic priest in Boston, and between 1875 and 1900, he was the second bishop of Portland, Maine. The next son was a man named um, uh, Hugh, doesn't matter his name, but he was a businessman in uh, New York City. He died young in a freak accident, but seemed to be climbing the economic ladder there. Patrick became a Jesuit, and from 17, I'm sorry, 1873 to 1882, he was the president of Georgetown. Sherwood became a priest. He became the rector of the Cathedral of the Holy Cross in Boston, in the South End, in a white Irish neighborhood. These are all people under the laws of the United States who are considered at the time black Americans. Michael became a captain in the Revenue Cutter Service, uh, the precursor to the, to the Coast Guard, a captain. That is, again, something that was not accessible to black Americans at the time. The three girls went into, the, um, the, into convents. One later left a convent and married and lived outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And one guy just ran away and became a wastrel. There's always that one guy, right? <laughs> and he's always like the most interesting. And of course, there's never any paperwork on him. So the real question e here is, how did they do it? How did they manage to do it? And this is what the reason that I love this story. They did it in part through triangulating race and religion in the 1840s. Parishioners in the south end of Boston even accepted Sherwood who of all the family members that, uh, that pictures exist of, looked the most like a black American because they referred to him as Father Healy. He was a member of the Catholic Church, and if the Catholic Church said he was the, the, the priest, he was the priest, regardless of what his background was. They went to confession to him. 
They told him intimate stories about their lives. They accepted his, uh, his uh, um, religious advice, his religious guidance. They gave money to the church. They took orders from him. In a way, he was hiding in plain sight. And when he traveled across the country, he did not ride in Jim Crow cars. He rode in the white section of the car. So all of them reached heights of accomplishment in the United States that were out of reach for most white Americans, and yet here they were black Americans who had done that. And they did it, apparently, by aligning with the Catholics. And by aligning with Catholics, who were a marginalized group in the 1840s, especially here in the Boston area, just as immigrants were arriving in large numbers after the potato famine, by aligning with the Catholics, who themselves were being turned against really dramatically by Protestants burning uh, Catholic property, for example, in Boston, Catholics closed ranks around these mixed-race children and considered them white, even though some of them were visibly not white. And the idea that they were of mixed race or that they were technically qualified as black in the United States um, was really not an issue in their lives to the point that when the, the son, who um, Michael, who becomes a captain in the Revenue Service, he ends up getting, um, getting uh, court-martialed twice for his behavior and the way he's treating his men. And one of the men actually says on the stand, he is nothing but a damned Irishman which is really astonishing if you think about it. That idea that there is here in this very complicated family story, a story not only about race and about Americans' uh, racial categories in the 1870s, but also religion, I think shows the complexity of what those of us who study the liberal arts do, but not just in history, because that is also an extraordinarily human story. One of the things that is missing from the story, for all but one of the Healy's, a woman who married um, after she had been a nun, uh, is they don't develop intimate relationships that will require marriage because once you start marrying across the color line in that period, different issues might have come up. She marries across the color line into white society and lives outside of Boston. But by keeping sexuality out of their story, they help to maintain their passing through religion. But there is also, I think, a psychological story there that to me is even more profound than the stories of class and religion and race that are there. There is the story that when the boys had been here in New England, and of course they couldn't go home because if they passed back into the South, they could legally be enslaved. So they never went home. One goes home to get his younger siblings out when their parents die. Um, but, but the father sends a daguerreotype of their mother to the sons um, after they've left home for a while. And the historian of this family, a guy named James O'Toole, who's written a fabulous book on the Healy family, recounts the story and the letter that one of the brothers wrote to another saying, did you get the package from father? And, the, and saying, you know, I got it. Do you remember that woman? I think I remember that woman. That woman was their mother. And they had so divorced themselves from their past that they referred to her as that woman, which I think is itself a really interesting study that people who study the humanities delve into. The point of all this is that history is messy, of course, but that people are also messy. And understanding humanity, the story of humans, through the careful study of the liberal arts, is crucial to understanding the rules of our globe in a way that we can live together in a just society. And that understanding is crucial to protecting the idea of a government that is based on discernible facts. And that idea of living in a reality-based community has been pretty thin on the ground in the United States for decades. But I would like to suggest that the move toward restoring a reality-based community to the United States of America is underway.
just today, CBS News announced that it is launching a new streaming show this summer called CBS News Confirmed, and it will seek to identify and to stop the spread of false stories and conspiracy theories. In that search for the fact-based knowledge that people like CBS with luck will be disseminating across the United States, liberal arts scholars in general and the College of the Holy Cross in particular, as the only exclusively liberal arts undergraduate institution in the United States, go Holy Cross, is key to preserving the concept that we are all created equal and that we have a right to consent to the government under which we live. Thank you for listening. I have a range of questions, but is there anything that, that stirs for you, Vince, or for Elliot, that you'd like to, to start us off with? Well, it stirs a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, you know we've heard some really, really profound ideas about the importance of the humanities, but what really rested with me is the Healy story, which we've just recently spent some time here on campus thinking about from the perspective of the enslaved people who were sold by Georgetown, the 272. Actually, Holy Cross's involvement even predates that particular gift because the only reason the school could have been established in the first place by the Jesuits was because there was, there was money available from the sale of the 272 uh, in Maryland that, that would allow them to have the resources to establish colleges and universities elsewhere. But it, more personally for me, um, the issue of messiness and the situation we're facing in our country today where there is this extraordinary pressure and this sort of this movement that seeks to prevent us from delving into the reality of the messiness of the circumstances of our history, the messiness of our lives, the messiness of, of, of all of our personal stories such that we lose the, the truth uh, of how we came to where we are in so many different ways. And again, the Healy story, I think, is just a great example of that. For decades, you know, people lived in sort of ignorance of this story. Many people, though many of us whose personal stories were very similar, have known this story all our lives. And so it's interesting now that it's becoming s this point of awareness because, as I said, there's been so much pressure to prevent the story from being told and our study of the humanities to really allow us to delve deeply into these realities is essential to truth. And I think we have to be able to face this, the truth if we truly believe that we want to live in a free society, not one that is uh, you know, sort of run by people who want to traffic in lies so that they can control us. So thank you. So I mean, just to follow up on that, I, I think um, in the first part of your talk, I mean, we sort of put this in a, a formal question, if, if I may. The, you gave an account of liberal arts colleges, of colleges and universities as in some ways the um, stewards of uh, and the interpreters of a tradition of political liberalism, you know, sort of lock forward and the constitutional settlement and so forth. And that, that plugs into, I think, what, what it spark, sparked for me is some of the, the secularization of colleges and universities in the beginning in about the 1860s and then moving forward into some of the pro progressive reform movements of the teens and 20s when we really see a flourishing of the discourse of liberal arts and the idea that the liberal arts and, and undergraduate education was less instrumental in a variety of different ways and more about cultivation, cultivating um, the, the skills and habits and capacities necessary for free people. And that I think that, that really gets traction in the 1920s. And it, it sort of leads to a question that you, you sort of ended with, Heather, which has to do with what you think colleges and universities now, as both stewards of and interpreters of the past that you described and the traditions of political liberalism, as well as the pressures that Vince was alluding to, but what are the obligations 
that colleges and universities now have to uh, the cultivation of democratic habits of thought, the rule of law, or indeed of the future of democratic civil societies, the tradition that we are both inheritors of and interpreters of and, and cr critics of. So it's a reaction and a question. Recognizing that you're an administration and I'm not. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think what really needs to happen is administrators need to do everything the faculty wants, right? <laughs> Um, that was not the right answer. Yeah, <laughs> just thought I just thought I'd try it, you know. Um, so there, lots of people ask me this question about whether or not universities have an obligation to be explaining the the different parts of the liberal order, by which I mean the institutions under which we live, and how those really have been neglected in in. I was not going to say the university, how those have been uh, um, neglected in our understanding in the United States. And there's a reason for that, a political reason that that's happened. We can talk about it if you want. But, but I'm actually not, uh, I do think, of course, I think everybody should teach American history a lot of the time. But I actually don't think that we have a specific role to say, hey, let's have a, a sit-in in demo on democracy. Let's do this. I, I actually believe, and I'm, I don't, I'm not willing, it's not a hill I'm willing to die on, because if people want to do that, hey, go for it. Um, I'll even come speak. But that the idea that we are searching for truth and that we can debate anything so long as it is factually based seems to me to represent as well as to illustrate the inquiry that will enable us to create a just society. So that rather than saying, hey, your class on Baroque music needs to emphasize the, the themes of democracy, simply saying, no, your class on Baroque music has inherent value by teaching us how that music developed or whatever one takes in a class like that. I've never taken a class in Baroque music. But, but that itself has inherent value because it, it values the idea that we are in an intellectual enterprise to create a, a society based on discernible reality for human beings. And so, um, so I, 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 somebody asked me to give that talk this summer, and I'm like, I can't. I'm only doing political stuff this summer. But there it is in a nutshell. We need to do what we do best in the academy. That being said, I would like to see us interface outside the academy more effectively than we do. And there are that, I think, is the wave of the future, simply because the other piece that I didn't talk about, when people talk about the humanities being dead, you could not prove it by me, because people seem to me to be starved for history and literature and the history of music and languages. and. The problem is that those of us who study those things are not in the same spaces that they are, and we haven't really figured out how to interface between the two. So I think there's plenty of work to be done there, um, but I don't think we have to revamp what we do to become something that we're not. I think we need to keep doing what we do really well. You're all the Baroque musicians who were like, thank <laughs> God I don't have to start reading the Wall Street Journal, right? There are a couple of questions from students uh, that relate to the question about cost, about we talk about the humanities and um, given the high cost of higher education, one of them is uh, Julianne Hawley, class of 27, how we justify or think about the cost of college and the humanities uh, when many jobs require some graduate school as well. So I guess the question, and, and the other question relates back similarly uh, are we creating the problem because for the humanities because they seem untenable for students who are perhaps paying? Do you guys want to start with that one? Uh, well, I'll jump in and just uh, try to frame it and quickly. You know, I, I think you know the cost of education, the cost of higher education, is is a problem often that's raised you know individually to institution and institutional leaders when in fact it's a systemic problem. Uh, it's a it it has to do a lot with how we think about education in this country, what we value relative to other things, um, you know, how we have, um, I think, professionalized and objectified learning uh, in the sense that it has to have some material outcome to be valuable. It has to di directly connect to, in this case, a job because it costs so much, so I have to pay for it, 
And you know, if, I, if what I'm learning does not allow me to step away immediately upon graduation into a remunerative uh, activity, then there, what I just did must not have value. Um, and that's, I think, partially due to the misalignment of values across the culture and across the society. We are not willing to support higher education at a level that, say, we see in other, in other countries through public funding, for instance. Um, and um, you know, we increasingly see public funds being withdrawn from higher education. And I think that returns us to some of Heather's key points, right? So we are de-emphasizing or, or you know, defunding the things which would allow young people to have rich intellectual experiences, which would allow them to be engaged as citizens across a wide range of activities throughout their lives, not just their first job out of college. Um, and so, consequently, they themselves are asking the question, is what I'm doing even valuable? I can't, it's expensive. I don't know how I can afford it. People are telling me that it's not valuable in all kinds of ways explicitly and, and not. So, um, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why this is a problem, but one thing I can say, and you, many of you in this room know, to deliver what we deliver in terms of an educational experience is inherently not cheap. It requires resources, and it requires a society to understand how it will prioritize its resources in ways that achieve the goals that we're seeking to achieve in the humanities, for instance, in higher education. Do you know off the top of your head the statistics for how m deeply cuts in public education have been since the 1980s? I don't know this, the uh I don't want to just say either. it, but I think it's, I think it's 57 percent sticks in my head. Well, I can tell you that specific institutions where I have colleagues and I know, I mean, they can say that their funding has gone, you know, funding they might have received from a state has gone to something, say, like 40 percent to 10. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty standard. Uh, across a wide range of public institutions. And remember, these were the institutions that were often created to, to serve local populations so that education would be accessible to a broad range of people in the, in the state. And these very state legislatures are now taking away the funding. And what message does that send? This is not important. This is not valuable. We will not fund it. And that, um, I mean, there are many layers to that as well, I think. There's that things that are changing in higher education. There's more of an emphasis now, again, on, um, uh, uh, on professions uh, on, like, uh, I can't think of the word all of a sudden, uh, professions like um, engineering, electrical, STEM. You know, uh, what's the word? STEM, STEM field? Well, no, I was thinking, uh, uh, I was thinking you, instead of going to college, you go to a profession, trade, trade, trade school, trade school, trade school, there you go. Yeah. Um, and there, you know, there's been all sorts of societal things as well um, that have uh, that have created really weird interactions with the concept of education really since the 1980s. So it's not an easy fix. I would suggest that it has been a very good thing to have uh, First Lady Jill Biden in the White House because she's put so much money into, or she's urged the putting of so much money into community colleges. But my guess is that the, the system we have currently is unsustainable, and we will have to find a new way both to fund the, the education, but also how to construct that, that funding um, so that we move the entire country forward in a productive way rather than um, just different silos. You know, I mean, just to follow up on that, one of the, you alluded to the, the intensity of interest in humanities. At the same time, we have the question sort of suggests a, um, either an anxiety or um, the reality of the instrumentalization of undergraduate education. Right. So that there is a deep understanding that, you know, from the moment that you enter, you're on a conveyor belt towards a career outcome. And I think that that's actually less present in liberal arts colleges for the, some of the reasons you alluded to. And that, that one of the reasons I'm optimistic about liberal arts colleges as a category and about this college in particular is because I think that we, we have the opportunity to tell the story of the integrated liberal arts and to resist some of the instrumentalization of undergraduate education, which is harder to do at a much larger research university. So I think some degree of optimism about the sector that we inhabit, um, I at least find some optimism about the sector we, we inhabit in part because what you've just described is the intensity of interest in the arts and the humanities is, is everywhere. And if we can try to bring those two things together in public discourse, 
it won't necessarily address the cost of operating, but it will at least, I think, enter that, enter into the value proposition conversation in ways that we were maybe not as present as we would like. So I know we need to get on to more questions, but, but one of the things that I think we will, that we should grapple with as well in education is, and, and I hear all the time people say to me, why, when I talk about history, why didn't anybody ever tell me this when I was in <laughs> high school and college? And I'm like, I hate to say this, but they did. You know, you were interested in the, the kid at the next desk and you weren't <laughs> paying any attention. And, and the reason I say that is because it has certainly been my experience that you come to an appreciation of history after college, and not because you're stupid in college, but because in order to understand big sweeps, you, it's my light bright theory of history. You have to have enough little lights that you can see the big picture, and you don't get those little lights until you live through things. I was out of graduate school before I realized that the Missouri Compromise did not stretch the entire way across the country. And I was in graduate school before I realized that the French Revolution was after the American Revolution. Because nobody told me, or at least I hadn't heard it. <laughs> so one of the, and, and similarly, if you think about the theater, for example, the reality is that the people who can afford to go to the theater are older, right? And the way we do education now, the idea that you're supposed to learn everything you have to learn by the time you're 22, and then you go to professional school, and then I don't know what you do, I guess you watch TV, seems to me that <laughs> is something that, that as a society, we should grapple with, because frankly, I feel like educating people in history right now, the way I do it, and people who are older and have the, the, the experiences to say, oh yeah, I remember that, or oh wait, I've heard of that, or to put those together, is a much different experience and in many ways more rewarding than saying to somebody, you know, I know you've never heard of any of this stuff, but with luck, a little of it will stick. Um, and that would be something that would be lovely to see in our societal understanding of education is the recognition that it is not just until you're 22. If we're doing it right, it's a lifetime. But not just for those few elite people who can afford to go to an elite institution, but for everybody so that it becomes, you know, you don't just have to, to hit 22 and, and, I don't know, watch whatever you watch on TV. I don't watch TV. Um, but that you actually have ongoing education for the entire population. Um, when I used to live in London, um, you know, everybody would go home on Friday nights and watch David Attenborough. You know, like literally, people were like, oh, I can't do Friday night, we gotta watch David Attenborough. And I thought at the time, you know, isn't that great not only for the development of, of people's minds, but also that this is shared. Then you can be on the tube and say, hey, what'd you think of those dancing lobsters, you know? Um, so that would be nice to go doing for going forward as well. So you've answered the elite question. I can move right <laughs> on with that one. Uh, a student question asks, uh, how do you think the political climate will affect how the humanities are taught and the possible dying off or survival of the humanities? Do you believe the political climate could, will get rid of the study of certain languages, for example, and just drive us towards monolingualism? That is a really complicated question and a very good one. My friend Tom Nichols of The Atlantic always says, Y'all are so worried and, you know, we're really fine by 2028 because the kids are great. The kids are going to rebuild all this. And I keep saying, and the demographics suggest that, in fact, it is the, the younger generations who will be the demographic majority, including the voting majority, by 2028. And my answer is always, we need to make sure there is an election in 2028. Because if we don't get this one right, the answer could go either way. In fact, as you, you probably know, there's a huge move afoot amongst the radical right to get rid of public schools in favor of a voucher system, which takes public money and, and channels it to private institutions. And those private institutions are selective, of course, which means that they only take certain students, but they are overwhelmingly in the United States Christian schools. And they are Christian schools that are emphasizing the same kind of traditional religious laws that I was just speaking against. If, in fact, we end up with a national government that promotes those, uh, and, and by the way, it's partly for religion, but it's also because there is a boatload of money to privatize there. 
If you can take tax dollars and put them all into the hands of private companies, private institutions, you're redistributing an awful lot of public wealth into private hands, and that's part of the impetus for that. If we get that, we will, of course, see the same thing across the board. And you're already seeing in a number of states the, um, the, the pulling back of what people are able to teach. And, and the, you know, uh, in Louisiana, there was just a case yesterday, I think, I tend to lose track of time, but where they're taking tenure away from somebody who um, had spoken out against a new governor. And that's something that absolutely could happen, could happen. But we are also seeing an enormous backlash against that in the country, and we could, in fact, reinvest in all the things that we care about going forward. So I would love, the, I'd love to say to you, well, I'm, I'm very concerned because I see these things and we're all going to hell in a handbasket, or, well, look, we got all these good things going on and we could end up with a rejuvenated educational system, but all I can say right now is that we could see it going either way, and I don't know which it's going to be in this particular election. By the time we get to the, the future, the United States either has to rebuild its educational system or consign itself to being a, 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 a bottom tier um, nation. Are we going to do that? I have a hard time believing at the end of the day that Americans will put up with that, but I can't tell you that we're out of the woods yet. Okay. Professor Klinghardt asks, Daniel Klinghardt, the humanities fairly and unfairly has gained a reputation of late for being politicized, in particular for having a bias for the political left. What do we do with that? Is it a problem? If not, do we need to do something to challenge the perception that it is? So, so you, the, it's such the wrong question to ask me. You know how we got the idea that the academy is liberal? Um, and by the way, liberal is, n should not be an epithet. That was a deliberate political effort to turn the word liberal into an insult. In fact, the idea of um, the liberal consensus coming out of World War II was embraced by Republicans and Democrats both. And it stood for a society that emphasized the ideas of liberal democracy, the ideas we should be treated equally before the law and have a right to a say in our government. That's what liberalism was about. And it's got a longer history behind it, but that's what it meant. So the idea of the academy being liberal comes from the people who called themselves movement conservatives. Actually, they didn't start to call themselves that until the 1970s, but they accepted it and we read it back onto them because they're the exact same people, literally. Like William F. Buckley Jr., when he starts using it, he was one of the people in on the ground floor. And what, what they recognized, those people who didn't like the liberal consensus, and they were primarily in the 1950s those who objected to the regulation of business and the higher taxes that that liberal consensus required, they recognized that they had to stop saying, hey, let's get rid of the New Deal, let's get rid of Eisenhower's Middle Way, and let's go back to the period of the 1920s because that's the way government should really work. And Americans looked at that in the 1950s with their union jobs and their four bedroom homes and their, you know, ca their Cadillacs with fins and, s and their two week vacations and they said, you people, are, whatever you're smoking, we don't want it. I paraphrase, that's not actually what they said. But they wouldn't vote for those candidates. So William F. Buckley Jr. writes this book in, in 1951 called God and Man at Yale or the Superstition of Academic Freedom. That's the, the subtitle to it. Mm. And what he says is that we have to stop arguing on, on the, uh, this idea that academies should be full of the free exercise of argument based in fact. Because every time we do that, we lose. So instead of doing that, we need to start from the premise that the United States needs to have what he calls free enterprise. That is the idea, get rid of re business regulation, get rid of taxes. We need free enterprise, and we need Christianity. He's a devout Catholic, and so is his brother-in-law, Al Brent Fazell. So, uh, they meet at Yale. But so, um, so we need to start from that premise. So we can't argue about those. That's what we need to start from. And at Yale, and Yale, by the way, in the 1940s when he is there, is incredibly on the right of the liberal consensus. But the people who are there do believe in the liberal consensus. And he says, look here at how, how crazy liberal everybody at Yale is. And he writes this, this it's a really querile book, in which he assumes that everybody is, has a conspiracy against him, so, well, never mind. But take my word for it on that, but I'm happy to talk more about it if you want. Um, 
So he says these are all liberals. These people are all liberal. And by that he means that whether they're Republicans or Democrats, they believe in a fact-based argument to discern the, the rules of the way the, the globe works, the way the world works. So three years later, in 1954, he writes um, uh, McCarthy and his enemies. And in McCarthy and his enemies, he divides the country between good people, capital C, conservatives like him. And they're not conservatives. They're conservatives in that liberal consensus. They're actually radicals. They're trying to destroy the liberal consensus. And everybody else is an L, capital L, liberal. And he does that to make them look like they're capital C communists. And what he says is that they have taken over places like the press and the courts and the academy. The academy is liberal. And by the time you get into 1971 with the Powell memo when, um, when, a justice, when Lewis Powell is going to become a, a justice, not a chief justice, under Richard Nixon, he does the Powell memo for the Chamber of Commerce and he says, listen, we got to push back in all these places against this idea of fact-based argument. You get the idea that, that somehow there is left-wing indoctrination in the academy. Now, that is where we get the history of that. The reality is that when people are exposed to different ideas, they do tend to step outside their bubbles. So, so many people who are in evangelical communities, for example, insist that college has turned their children into liberals. What they're really reacting to is that when you get out of your bubble and you meet people who are not like you, you recognize that they are not some evil being, that they're actually human beings and you start to see the world slightly differently. So if you think about the idea of institutions as opening, broadening minds, guilty as charged, but the idea that we are trying to indoctrinate people politically is as untrue for those people on the left side of the liberal consensus as it is to people on the right side. That is, there are professors, I've known some on both sides, who feel that you need to think the way they do when you're in your, class, their, your classrooms. The vast majority of us don't talk politics in the classroom. We're just trying to teach you to write a five-paragraph essay. And if we could get you to read the syllabus, that would be great, too. <laughs> but what we're, what we're really trying to do is to teach people how to think. So, th so is that true? That's my explanation of that. How do we push back on that? I hope I just did, but I think we keep doing what we're doing because the reality is that when students come to us and they are exposed to different ideas, whether or not they agree with them, they're going to think a little bit differently, and that's what we're trying to do, unlike those people who want to make sure they are not exposed to those kind of ideas. The mic is there at the center if anyone does want to jump up, but I'll stay with it, please. As long as it's on the liberal arts question. Great. This is tall for me. Sorry. It, it, it down. I'm standing, I promise. Um, hi, thank you for being here, first of all. I'm a high school teacher, um, social studies, so thanks for the shout out before, because we try, we really do, and I promise we are telling people them the, the things. Um, my question is actually um, with regard to um, the idea that you sort of alluded to before in that the, the, the making sure that democracy is safe should not be a political thing, it's not owned by either side. Um, and so one of the things that I'm sort of most concerned about is the idea of echo chambers. Um, and the, the thought that with echo chambers it's really hard to sort of stop the group think that happens. Um, and I guess my, my question is if you have any ideas, advice about how to sort of break that, especially when we are in our classrooms and perhaps we come across a student where we're not necessarily trying to push political views, um, but trying to open their minds to think a little bit differently um, and what we can kind of do to sort of lead them in different directions or sort of give them other options. Well, you know, I think that as historians, we have it really easy, and that's gonna sound like a funny thing to say, but, but what I always try to do in a, in a classroom, I won't talk politics in a classroom. I'm, I'm not, not, not only on principle, because I do recognize the, the power dynamic in a classroom, and, um, and that's very different than the power dynamic outside a classroom where I'm happy to talk about politics. I will say that I'll talk, I will talk politics after class if you want to, but also, I don't do it because history is my happy place. 
And I don't, I don't want to think about politics when I'm in the classroom. I want to think about even Andrew Jackson. You know, that's, that's my idea of a good time. Um, um, I don't know if you read me last night, but like, I love that they're relying on a law from the Arizona Territory in 1864, because I have read those territorial laws. And nobody ever asks about them usually. So I'm like, this is my moment to shine. Like, I've read those territorial laws. And would love to tell you more about them if you want to hear more about them. But, um, but one of the things that we have as historians, in a way that I think perhaps other genre, or other stu fields of study don't have, is that I always think of it as getting below. For some reason, I think be below, not below, beyond, below today's politics. That is, when I look at today's politics, I don't look at them as a partisan today. I look at the sweep of American history and say, what does this look like? Like, where can we look at things that looked something like this in a time in which people do not take a position? And one of the things, again, that I think that historians have a great advantage w with is you must have noticed, if you read me, how much I talk about Abraham Lincoln. I'm a fan of Abraham Lincoln, but I do that in part because even if you don't know anything about American history, you've heard of Abraham Lincoln. So it's a doorway in. And that's one thing that, that makes it easier, I think, for history teachers to deal with some of the trouble that is out there without having to take it head on, is to go in through the past. That being said, you know, one of the great tricks that's that um, uh, former history, high school history teacher from Brookline taught me was that students want to talk about the present. And, and they often come from echo chambers. And what he would always say is, we can talk about anything in my classroom so long as it is not abusive to anybody or violent or hate speech, but you must make sure that everybody has access to the same information. So you need to bring that information in before we can talk about it, and it needs to be from reliable sources, and we will discuss what those sources are. And that meant that a lot of people recognized that the things that they were bringing into the classroom were actually propaganda, and that they, they did not bring them into the classroom. That's not something I've really had to deal with in college. You people are on the front lines. Do you have more suggestions for how people can handle it? <laughs> <laughs> can I can I just jump in on that? I mean, totally. I think it's such a great question, um, and just very briefly, I mean, I think Heather said it beautifully. But historians have primary sources, and primary sources are often the way you puncture the, you know, works like you were learning the 1776 project. So something like that, which is shallow regime propaganda. If you look at the primary sources of the past, you can't come to that same set of conclusions. And so I think, I mean, I just think you said it beautifully. The other thing about echo filter bubbles and echo chambers is that understanding the architecture of the internet, that is to say, how the, the networked public sphere creates those phenomena is also part of the way to sort of move people beyond it, to understand how information is served and presented and then is reinforced so as to not only polarize, but also to, to sort of reinforce what, what one already believes. So understanding the mechanisms through which information reaches students, then I think, can, and, and others, can also um, then begin the process of saying, well, I need to think about how I'm accessing information a little more differently. Well, and another point, I think, to add to this is, in being on the front lines, I think it's important to you, and I'm thinking of it through my own experience as a law professor. Now, something I often dealt with in the, as a law professor, teaching first-year students, is they would often come from, well, if not bubbles, they had recreated new bubbles for themselves. They had finally, after college, they knew what was true and what was right. And then we, they're in the, a law school classroom with you know 95 hungry other you know pre-law students or you know first-year law students who are challenging them at this high level based on a new set of a new paradigm, the law school paradigm, where you have to be very very tightly, you know, um, connected to a certain set of materials. And if you wander from those materials, you're wrong, right? So. And routinely, uh, I would get very, very angry students upset about the horrible things that were said to them, and I'd say, but that was the law, right? You know, the, the law, yes, I know that's the law, but it's wrong. It's like, that's not going to win your case. So, um, you know, there's this problem right now in this country where a, a lot of young people 
have been taught or told that they're always supposed to feel good about what they're learning and they're not supposed to ever have discomfort. And I don't blame them, I blame the adults that are pushing that through legislation in states like Florida, which seem to argue that if you confront difficult issues or you confront the possibility that you may be wrong, that somehow that's, that can't be, that's not acceptable. So really creating a space where people understand that the en encounter of real facts may be shattering at times, uh, but that you can recover uh, because having real knowledge about true things will actually be better for you in the long run, will actually allow you to do what you need to do in the case of law at a higher level. But we have to figure out how to function as a society where people can engage with the notion that some of the stuff about my country, about my community, some of those things are, are upsetting. Yeah, there's also a, a, a weird thing in, in the United States that, that, you know, I'm 61. It, it feels to me like we didn't have it when I was younger, and that's that people don't argue ideas anymore. They feel that they are their ideas. And so you can't say, well, no, actually, you're wrong about that because, he, because they take that personally. And I, that's something that I've really, I, I was trained to argue, and I love to argue. Um, that sometimes gets me to a different place, sometimes gets somebody else to a different place, but that's, you know, that's what my friends and I do. We sit around and say, well, what do you think about this? And we bring in different material, and, and it's not personal. It's really, it's, we're trying to come up, we're trying to think something through together, and that's really rare. I can't tell you how many times I've been at places and be making an argument and have somebody be like, well, you know, you're attacking me, or, or turn around and say, well, you're dumb. You know, and it's like, well, Okay, that's fine, but that doesn't speak to the to the argument here, and that comes back, I think, to liberal arts. We need to teach people how to argue and recognize that it's not, you know, if if you say your your paper needs work, that doesn't mean you're a horrible person. It means you need to learn how to write a paper, and that's a divorce that that um, that I grew up with. You know, it was not a if you failed your French exam, it didn't mean you were useless, it meant you needed to learn more French. It was not about you as, an, as, as your value as a person, and that seems that we have married them to the point that, you know, somebody gets a, a, a C on a something and they start crying. Yeah. Uh, one more question, and I hope it's not too long, but uh, maybe Heather, you can take this in particular, uh, and it's a riff on a, a faculty question, but um, we as an institution are facing the question of how we get people who disagree with us in a polarized society to listen to us. And the faculty member asks, uh, you probably get labeled as a, one of the liberal elite, uh, and therefore your ideas might be considered too biased to be listened to or trusted. So if you have the opportunity to talk to someone who might say that or cancel you or doesn't pay attention, uh, what do you want to say about how you get them to remain open to your perspective? And maybe I would take the question further and say, what do we learn from that? about how people who might dismiss what we have to offer in the liberal arts and say, oh, that's just liberal stuff. How do we bring them back in to seeing the value of what we're doing? Okay, so there are two separate questions there. Speaking of which, having learned to argue, right? <laughs> the, you, I, I'm always putting stuff in the right lane. You, there's a question about there's what I do. Correct. And, and there's also the question about what one does in a classroom. And those are really different that, things. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're talking about what I do in public, where I'm trying to make an argument to protect democracy, and I don't care if there's an R by your name or a D by your name or an I by your name or a G by your name or a Martian by your name, I want to emphasize the importance in this moment of the institutions of liberal democracy and protecting them. And that is a political goal more than it is a, a, a liberal arts goal. And in that case, I will say that Political scientists will tell you that when you have a reactionary right-wing movement, it gets between 28 and 33 percent, 32 percent of the population, and they're lost. There's no point in me talking to them. They are um, they are wedded to the illiberal movement right now, and they are mimicking the same qualities as somebody has in an abusive relationship, tying themselves tighter and tighter to a strong man and. It's like Bellatrix Lestrange in, in Harry Potter. The worse that Voldemort treats Narcissa and her family, the tighter that, that Bellatrix clings to Voldemort. I don't have time for them because that's not gonna change. I'm not gonna change them. I mean, I wish them well, 
but I'm not going to have anything to do with them. I'm trying to reach those people who are reachable by talking about the principles of liberal democracy and saying, listen, I don't care if we disagree about any number of issues. You do not have to think like me. You have to care about the institutions that enable us to work out our differences. That's different than a classroom, because in a classroom, um, you're, you are, with luck, not dealing with people who are already turned off to your message. The very fact they're at an institution of higher learning suggests that they might be willing to, to hear things that make them uncomfortable or that make them think differently. And if that's the case, I think for historians and maybe for, for literature people, I'm not going to go through the list here, um, the idea that we're in part of an intellectual inquiry that is looking at the tools of history, for example, or literature or whatever, with luck, I think, makes people reachable. Um, it has been my experience that it made people reachable. The, they're all the people might think of me as being um, on the left side of the liberal consensus. Uh, when I have taught at BC, I was asked to advise not only the uh, conservative student union, but also the communists. And I thought that was a real mark of how tr much trust they had in my classroom, that they felt that I would be a fair faculty advisor regardless of what, what their particular bent was. So I think that the idea of focusing not on modern politics so much as the, the liberal arts inquiry in which we are engaged should make students reachable. That's not to say that because of what I do now politically, there are some students that are not reachable to me, and I think that's a hideous loss. Uh, it might even drive me out of the classroom, to be honest. So that's the best I got. But for me, a recognition that there's a difference between politics and the intellectual inquiry in, watch, in which one is engaged in the classroom, that's an important distinction to me. And um, and makes everybody much more accessible in a classroom than they than they would necessarily be on Facebook. Well, thank you. Thank you for bringing us back to Ann Hutchinson, as you promised, for taking us through history and for helping us think about the larger questions that we're facing. Thank you, Vince and Elliot.